So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the first uh, event in our uh, Alan Turing Year uh, series. Uh, what I'm going to uh, give you today is uh, hopefully a story. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you, well, since we are in Iceland, a saga. And this is the saga of the intellectual journey that brought us from uh, developments that date back to uh, at least the 17th century, and in fact, they can be traced back all the way down to the antique era mechanism uh, that the Greeks developed, well, a couple of thousands years ago, uh, all the way to uh, the machines that several of you uh, are using as we speak so that they can check their email in case they get bored by uh, my presentation. And I will try to uh, convince you, if there is any convincing at all, that uh, a man by the name of Alan Matheson Turing played a, an outstanding role, a dramatic role in the development of the computer, and not only of the computer itself, but of what we understand as computation today, co computational processes. Uh, now you might ask yourself, okay, why do we have this series of talks this year, 2012, at Reykjavik University? Well, the fact is that sort of 2012 is the centenary from the birth of Alan Turing. And what we are doing here at Reykjavik University this year uh, is uh, just but a drop in the ocean of uh, celebrations that are taking place all over the world. There is an hyperlink here. Let me not click on it so that I don't bore you immediately with hyperlinks. If you follow that URL, you will see a humongously long list of events that are taking place all over the place. And in fact, you can find us there uh, under events at Reykjavik University. So we are just giving our uh, small talk and our appreciation to uh, a great scientist. Now, why Turing? I mean, what has the guy done? I mean, sort of, uh, Turing is not like Einstein. I mean, he's not sort of that household name for many of us. Maybe some of you do not actually know who Turing was. Uh, so you might, ask, well, you might ask yourself, what is all this fuss about? Well, if you go to the Alan Turing webpage and you click on another hyperlink, you will find a quotation that says, there isn't a discipline in science that Turing has not had an impact upon. When you click on it, you see uh, Andrew Miller MP uttering essentially that statement. Now, I'm Italian. I'm cynical. I mean, whenever politicians say something, you just don't believe it. And I think that you Icelanders, for the Icelanders in the audience now, agree with me that politicians are not to be trusted. You probably trusted them before, but you certainly don't do it anymore. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, actually, the guy has a point. The guy has a point. And I hope that at the end of this series of talks, not just mine, but the series of talks that will span these uh, Alan Turing centenary celebrations that we have, you will all agree with me that Turing actually was a great thinker, not just for computer science, not just for mathematics, mathematical biology, philosophy, neurosciences, in many, many different fields, the, the, the guy has left the mark. Not only what he's thought, but for me as, uh, well, a pseudoscientist maybe, he also left the mark in the way that he was approaching his work. And I hope that I will highlight uh, a couple of quotations from him during this talk that will uh, tell you that uh, he was an old school scientist in the best sense of the world. So let me tell you uh, in the best tradition of the evening news, what is it that I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you and finally I'm going to tell you roughly what I've told you. <laughs> so let me start with a short biography of Turing. Now I mean all volumes uh, like this great book by Andrew Hodges, Alan Turing, The Enigma, have been written about the life of Turing and about his, his work. I encourage you to read those, so I'm not going to spend one hour telling you what the life of Turing was about, but I'm just going to highlight a few points that will relate to the talks that you're going to hear in this series. I'll then embark on a journey together with you, a very, very brief, speedy journey, from the, of, of the history of ideas that led to the development of the idea of the computer, starting from Leibniz, I could have started a long time ago, before, but starting from Leibniz and ended up with Turing and the first computers. I'll then focus on something a little bit more technical. 
namely sort of where the idea of the universal computer, the programmable computer, came from. And this was all set down in a paper that Turing wrote at age 24 in 1936, long before machines called computers were actually built. And I will introduce the concept of Turing machines and how they came about in his attempt to uh, define what were computable real numbers and what kind of problems can be algorithmically solved. And I'll then give you a trailer for the rest of the series of events, at least for this spring. I hope that we will continue for the whole year with lots of interesting events. Uh, but I'll give you a little trailer for the events which are pretty much decided by now. And I land with an epilogue, which is the take home message, which you will be able to tell your boyfriends and girlfriends when you go home. Assuming you will be willing to go home afterwards. <laughs> so here's a little biography of Turing in two slides, focused essentially on his scientific uh, contributions. I'm not going to tell you very much about his life. Huh? Just let me tell you that Turing was a, really a true son of the British Empire. Uh, his father was stationed in India. He met, his, he met Turing's mother on a boat traveling back to the UK for a, a vacation from his post in India. And in fact, he went back to India basically after Turing was conceived. So since Turing was 18 months, he was probably le he was left uh, in the care most of the year in the care of someone else, of his grandparents, say, I don't really recall what would they wear. But basically, he did not live with his parents very much. He was also a son of an intellectual climate. Now, I see there are some British people in the audience. Uh, so, uh, I, and what I, what I say I really believe, sort of, uh, there, I think there was a time when sort of academia in Britain was very much close in terms of uh, its, uh, its ideas to what, what was happening in ancient Greece, somehow. You would have people who would do unfettered uh, research they would try to uh, have an healthy mind in an healthy body, mens sana in corpore sano, as the uh, Latins used to say. Turing was a marathon man. He ran a marathon in two hours and 46 minutes, which is not too bad, actually, for a complete amateur. Huh? Well, so these are people who would think deeply about difficult questions. He was also a product of, uh, well, the old boys' networks. Uh, he studied at Cambridge. Uh, he studied in a boarding, he lived in a boarding school in Sherburne. Uh, like in ancient Greece, in this type of establishment, homosexuality was not, uh, was not a bad thing. Unfortunately, he lived in a very Puritan uh, environment, because whereas on the one hand there were lots of homosexuals in many boarding schools, uh, homosexuality was a crime. So you could be acquitted, committed of uh, gross indecency, and be prosecuted for it. And this is something that will play a role uh, in Turing life, as I hope to mention towards the end. But let's focus on the science for the time being. Uh, Cambridge sort of was the <laughs> university where Turing studied. And under the supervision of a mathematician by the name of Max Newman, who played a, was Turing's mentor and played a major role it is in his intellectual development, he wrote a thesis uh, which became a paper called On Computable Numbers and the Decision Problem. Forget about the uh, German war there, Hans Heisung's problem. Uh, 1936, age 24. That's going to be our main focus today. Uh, this was not a, a PhD thesis. There were not so many PhD theses granted at that time. But Turing did get a PhD thesis, studied with a famous logician, Alonso Church, in Princeton, in uh, 1939, he published a thesis uh, on systems of logic based on ordinals. This had much less impact outside mathematical logic than his earlier work. And in fact, that, as I will tell you later on, Alonso Church and Turing, they, sort of, they were very much intertwined scientifically. In fact, it turned out that what Turing did in this paper the main result that he had, one of the main results that he had, had already been established by Turing, by Church before. Why did, not, why did not this kill Turing's contribution? I will tell you later on, because they were very, very different. When he came back from uh, Princeton, uh, Turing became deeply involved in uh, uh, 
an enterprise which uh, was related to the Second World War. He played a major role in Bletchley Park, uh, in the government code and cipher school, in uh, decrypting uh, the, uh, cipher t the cipher codes used by the German na by the Nazis in the Second World War, especially by, by the Navy, the German Navy. This was truly an event that changed the course of the war in more ways than one. Uh, so in some sense, Turing is also a war hero. What he got out of that, we'll see later on as well. Now, in order to decrypt codes, you can use pen and paper and lots of people, and they were available. There were about 9,000 9, people uh, at a certain point working in Bletchley Park, but you did need computing machinery of some sort. You don't break codes just using pen and paper, not complicated codes. Now, Turing interests in the computer, in the universal computing facilities, played a major role there, and then were expanded in building the first British computer, the so-called ACE, Automatic Computing Engine. And at some point in the talk, I hope that I will uh, sort of compare the British computer to the American one that John von Neumann was building, and that played a major role also in the war in the Los Alamos project. At that point, since he was more and more interested in computing machinery, Turing developed an interest, and in fact, he's also considered the father of artificial intelligence. Developed the intelligence, he developed an interest in uh, machines as thinking devices. Since uh, 1930, when he was at uh, Sherborne College, uh, Turing really thought deeply about what it means to have a mind. Are there scientific scientific approaches that you can use to understand the mind. And he always believed that our brains are really nothing but very large digital state machines. And if that is the case, once you build a computer, at least in principle, there is no reason why a computing device could not emulate the human mind. And Turing then worked on artificial intelligence. He developed the so-called idea of the Turing test, that some of you uh, may know there are even operas that have been written on the Turing test. And then he moved on to something which somehow is a natural continuation of that. He contributed to topics like artificial life and he studied morphogenesis, mathematical biology, where he gave, he gave apparently groundbreaking contributions. And there will be talks about many of these topics in this series. So that's Turing. Let's now go to the intellectual journey that brought humankind to develop computers. These machines that some of you study, that all of you use today. Now, how did the idea of the general purpose computing device, of the computer, come to be? I will give you a very simplified journey, but if you want to read the whole story in a very uh, engaging, written in a very engaging way, I suggest that you look at this book, Engines of Logic, by Martin Davis, a mathematical logician. It's really very well written, strongly recommended. Let's start our journey from 17th century Germany. Uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was a philosopher. He was also a mathematician. He was, one of the, he was the co inventor of the calculus that many of you know and love, okay? All of you use, some of you love, some of you maybe love a little bit less, I don't know. It depends on your inclinations. And he was also the subject of a famous controversy with Isaac Newton, uh, who eventually decided that he invented the calculus and the Leibniz did not. He even put together a committee of the Royal Society, which uh, uh, was probably presided by him in disguise and whose report was probably written by Isaac Newton. But anyway, sort of Isaac Newton was an outstanding fantastic scientist. But what I want to focus here is not calculus. It's something else. Leibniz had this idea that uh, when men of goodwill, natural philosophers, as they called themselves at that point, scientists, were discussing the true soul falsity of some uh, problem, and they could not agree, what they should do is to say, calculemos, let's calculate. What did he mean by that? What he meant was essentially the following thing. There should be a language, which he, called, which he called the calculus ratiocinator, which today we would call a programming language, in which you would be able to code up the problem that the natural philosophers were arguing about. 
And then by simply following mechanical rules from this description, from this program, <laughs> the philosophers will be able to uniquely and uni univocally determine what was the right answer. Now, for the computer scientists in this audience, this is just honey to their ears. Eh? So Leibniz has essentially prefigurated the idea of the general purpose programming language in which you would be able to code problems and then a computational engine, he was really thinking in terms of human computational engines, of rules that these humans would follow to calculate univocally the right answer. So that there would be no problems. Everybody, since we are talking about men of goodwill, everybody would agree with what was right. Now, as we all know, as the problems become very complicated, uh, pen and paper cannot suffice. So very early on, people started imagining, imagining machines that would actually carry on the calculations involved in going through the rules to determine whether this problem had a yes or a no answer, or whether the answer was 35 or 44, or whether the answer was X or Y. Several people worked on that, but let's speed on to Charles Babbage. So we move to the UK now. Babbage was an outstanding, a very good mathematician, and he imagined at some point a machine which he called the analytical engine. And this some point was roughly 1837. He proposed a mechanical general purpose computer, note it was mechanical, eh? general purpose computer, that incorporated lots of the things that today are in a general computer based on the von Neumann architecture. Arithmetical unit, control flow, branching, loops, and even an integrated memory. This machine could be programmed. And in fact, one of the early programmers was Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron. Uh, in fact, at the beginning, most programmers were women. For the women in the audience, tell your uh, maids, initially all programmers were women. I don't know what happened to them afterwards. So thanks to those of you who actually work with us uh, in computer science and belong to the fair sex. Uh, well, in fact, Ada Lovelace, unlike Babbage, actually thought of the analytical engine as a general purpose computing device, not just something for number crunching. That's limitative, uh, very limitative. Uh, she thought about this machine as being able to solve more abstract problems than number crunching. Babbage himself went on record as saying that this machine could do everything but compose country dances. Now, we all know that computers today can compose country dances. Maybe they are not very good at it. Maybe the music that comes out is not the best of the world. It might not be Mozart, but they can actually compute country dances. So our view of what can be computed or what computers can do has actually changed quite a bit from 1837. In fact, in 1984, in an issue of Time magazine that was devoted to software, the editor of a software magazine went on record as saying that if you put the right kind of software into a machine, it would do anything you want. There may be limits to what you can do with the machines themselves, but there are no limits to what you can do with software. Not the change. It can do everything but compose country dances to basically can do everything. Uh, and in fact, we just believe that computers can do just about anything we want them to do. And if they cannot do it now, everybody will tell you it's just a matter of time before they do so. So let me give you a little exercise which is Babbage inspired. Complete the following sentence. The computer can do everything but... Well, actually, most people would have problems in filling in this sentence with anything meaningful. Okay, we can say the computer can do anything but fall in love or find my next boyfriend. Uh, I'm not talking about problems of that kind. They are very important, but they are not the kind of problems that computing machineries have yet been designed to do. Uh, we are talking about scientific problems of some sort, form or another, and composing country dances is some kind of a scientific problem that can be formally specified. Now, Turing essentially contributed to filling in this question, amongst other things. So what did he do? He walked in and he asked the following question. Two very big questions. If you really want to understand, 
to fill in that question. You really need to deeply understand what computation is. You really need to deeply understand what a computational process or an algorithm, uh, a mechanical computational process is and what is it that it can do and what is it that it cannot do. Now, algorithms have been around since the beginning of humankind. Mechanical processes have been around since the beginning of humankind, but they've always been proposed in a positive sense. We have an algorithm for adding numbers. If we see an algorithm, we can recognize that that is really a mechanical process. But how do you ever establish that maybe some question cannot be solved by means of a mechanical process? To do so, you really need to understand what a mechanical process is. And Turing formulated, in some sense, the definitive answer to this question. And he did so while trying to solve a problem in mathematical logic that was posed by the eminent mathematician by the name of David Hilbert. So let me tell you what this problem was and where it, and where it arises. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, remember, Turing wrote his paper in 1936. So at the turn of the 20th century, Mathematicians start feeling, started feeling a little bit uneasy uh, about the uh, foundations of their subjects. All kinds of paradoxes were popping up, especially in a subject called set theory. Uh, so David Hilbert came around, and amongst one of the many things that he did was to sort of try and set the house in order. He said, OK, we've got to formalize mathematics so that paradoxes can be erased once and for all. We will be building our mathematical knowledge on a solid ground. His aim, which went sort of under the name of Hilbert's program, was to formalize mathematics and establish once and for all that mathematics was consistent. This means that from the rules of mathematics, you can never prove bullshit, contradictions. Mathematics was complete, which means that if there is a true statement about mathematical entities, then you will be able to prove it using the rules of the game. Rules of the game, mathematics, sort of logical processes. Moreover, ideally, mathematics should be decipherable. That is to say, there should be a mechanical process that given a mathematical fact as input, would be able to mechanically determine in a finite number of clearly defined steps whether that question has a true or a false answer whether what you're stating is true or false. Now, try to imagine sort of the feeling of uneasiness of the ordinary mathematician. If such a mechanical process existed, then it could really replace mathematicians uh, that could do more interesting things like sort of uh, emptying the sea with a bucket. Uh, or oh, well, I'm exaggerating here. Sort of, there will be always something for them to do. But note that what Hilbert was really asking for was a reduction of human deductive reasoning to mechanical computation. That's not a bad thing, or maybe it is a bad thing. I don't know. It depends on what you feel about it. But it's certainly a very lofty goal. Now, lofty goals sometimes have an act of being unattainable. And in fact, very soon, Hilbert's program <coughs> collapsed. But it was a glorious collapse, because out of this collapse came out computer science. So sometimes, uh, I mean, programs are successful, but they are dry. They do not produce anything interesting at the end of the day. Hilbert's program actually failed, but was a glorious failure because it produced computer science and the computer. Gödel showed that any mathematical theory which is formalized is going to be incomplete. There are things which are true and that you cannot prove. Moreover, even worse, in any formalized mathematical system, you are not able to establish the consistency of the system. That is to say, you're never sure whether within the system you can prove contradictions. Church and Turing came on and showed that there is no mechanical process to determine whether an arbitrary mathematical statement about the natural numbers with times and additions, so nothing mind-boggling, the stuff you work with since you were six years old, can actually ever exist. So mathematicians breathe a sigh of relief. They can never be replaced by computing machinery, uh, at least not always. What I'm going to focus on here are the contributions by Church and especially by Turing. 
Now, Church proved that an elementary problem in number theory is unsolvable in the lambda calculus. Now, what is the lambda calculus? I'm not going to tell you what it is, but basically, for those who are you from computer science and those who are not from computer science, think about a very, very simple programming language. In fact, it's the mother of all functional programming languages. It's a formalism for describing computable functions. Nothing else. Functions about the natural numbers and other objects. Moreover, Church showed that the lambda calculus could express exactly the same computational processes as another formalism which Gödel had produced, which he called the theory of general recursiveness. However, even after having seen Church's proof and the fact that what Church proposed was equivalent in terms of power to his own theory, Gödel was unconvinced. He did not think that yet humankind had reached an agreement of what a computational process was. In Walk Turing, he formalized the notion of computation using what we call today Turing machines. He didn't call them Turing machines himself, of course. He called them A machines for automatic machine. And he also showed that the very basic problem about these machines was unsolvable computationally. He also showed that Turing machines are equivalent in power to the lambda calculus and therefore also to Gödel's general recursiveness. Now Gödel was convinced. He went on record as saying that it was basically a miraculous achievement that all these different formalisms described exactly the same computational devices. Now you can ask yourself, why could Turing convince Gödel where Church did not. And that's one of the great contributions of the man. Now, let's try to think about what Turing thought process could have been, and in fact it was, because I'm going to use his own words, in coming up with the notion of Turing machine. And why was this concept so convincing? Now, typically, when we think about computational processes, about algorithms, we really think about a list of very well-defined computational rules that even I, as a person, could follow to obtain the answer in a mechanical fashion. Even though I do not understand what I'm computing, I just follow the rules and I get an answer out. That's why these machines can actually carry out uh, these processes. They don't understand what they're doing, but they do it. Because the process is so well spe specified that even I could do it. Examples of algorithms. Uh, you learn how to add two numbers. That's a mechanical process that you can follow all the time. And it will also always yield the right results unless you make a mistake. Euclid's algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor. One of the great algorithms that has been out there for 2,000 plus years. Now, algorithms are like recipes. I don't know how to bake a, a cheese souffle. I've never done it, but if I pick up a cookbook in French cooking, I follow the recipe step by step, lo and behold, the cheese souffle comes out. Maybe sort of it becomes flat after taking it out of the oven. Uh, this is an untri a, a tricky thing to cook, but if I follow the recipe, the right result comes out. Now, Turing leaps of imagination was one of his trademarks. He abstracted away from the algorithm, he moved his attention onto the cook, not the recipe. What does a person do while computing a number or the answer to or following a set of rules? He focused on computing real numbers because uh, that's what he wanted to do there. But that's what he said. And these are his words, pretty much. OK, so he imagined a man in the process of computing a number, uh, a real number. <coughs> Now, a man, while he computes a real number, or she computes a real number, is nothing but a machine that can only remember a finite amount of information. Uh, our memories are finite. We tend to forget things. Uh, so we only have a finite number of states of mind. And our state of mind really determines somehow what is it that we are going to do next in the computation. But as we compute, we all know that we need paper. Uh, like this roll of toilet paper that I brought with me today. There is, uh, this is not a coincidence that I brought a roll of toilet paper with me. Uh, why? Because Turing said, okay, paper can come in many forms, but in the simplest form, it's just a tape. 
It's a tape divided into squares. Uh, that's why toilet paper is, uh, is a good analogy here. And at each point in time, we can write some symbol on one of the squares. And of course, what we do next can de depend not only on my state of mind in my computation, but also on the symbol that I'm currently reading on one of the squares on this tape. Now, the tape is infinite. Uh, imagine an infinite roll of toilet paper, uh, ecologically friendly. Uh, you don't need to buy any more, but only one. Uh, imagine an infinite, an infinite tape. Now, why an infinite tape? Well, because Turing was interested in writing down real numbers, and we all know that many real numbers have an infinite decimal expansion. Moreover, you don't want to develop a theory of computation uh, that deals only with toilet papers of length two meters, and then uh, when uh, the next upgrade comes along, you need to develop another theory. Uh, so if you want to know what is it that can be computed in principle, you can just as well assume that you have an infinite amount of memory. This is what a Turing machine is, essentially. It's just a description of a computational pro process that has only finitely many states, and it can, uh, the Turing machine has essentially a tape head, uh, and the tape head reads at each moment in time only one of the squares on the tape, and the machine can make some very basic operations. Read the current symbol, change the state, write something on the current square, Move the tape head one step left or one step right. Nothing more. Now, fantastic. These machines can do just about anything that you can do with your computers today. In fact, they can do more because they have an infinite amount of memory. Huh? This is the idea. When Gödel actually saw that machines so simple so obviously computational, could do anything that much more complicated formalism could do, and in fact nothing more than that, he was fully convinced that Turing had actually pinpointed the precise basics of computation. And in rather humbly, in fact, Turing said, it is my contention that these operations include all those which are used in the computation of, of a number. And in fact, he showed that that was the case later on. Now, in every lecture, there has to be some fun break. I hope I've already given you some fun breaks here. Uh, but I want to show you what a Turing machine looks like. Uh, today, you can build them using uh, Lego bricks. Uh, so this is uh, the result of a student project uh, at the University of Aarhus in 2009. This is the Turing machine. There is also some nice music which has been uh, turned off here. But you can see what uh, a Turing machine looks like. It reads, it writes, and you can do everything with a Lego brick. This is equivalent to this computer in terms of expressive computational power. It's actually more fun once you look at how it works. So this is what reading is, in terms of Lego, Lego bricks. I hope that some of you, when you go home, you build, if you have Lego Mindstorms and sufficiently many Lego bricks, you will try and do this yourself. If you do, then we will certainly expose it in the sun, uh, and you will get a medal. So anyway, so this is, uh, this is a Turing machine in real life today. Uh, built using Lego bricks. And you can watch it on YouTube uh, at any point. Just type Turing machine. It's about two minutes long. Uh, so this machine is doing reading and writing. Comes with lots of optionals. Subject to availability, even an infinite tape. Wait. Oh, I think it's uh, the people, uh, the sound is coming from, uh, from Italy, actually. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. In fact, Turing did more. Turing did much more, did something absolutely fundamental, which is, plays an important role in the development of his idea of the universal computer. He actually realized that you can transform a program into a piece of data. 
You can take any program that you can ever write in any programming language and encode it as a natural number in such a way that the natural number uniquely represents the program. So you can convert the program into a number and you can undo this transformation. From the number, you can uniquely recover the program. Why was this an interesting idea? Gödel has actually used this idea himself in his proof of the uh, incompleteness theorem that I mentioned before. Turing used it in a positive sense. Once you've converted your program into a piece of data, programs become data that can be manipulated by other programs. In fact, he had this fantastic leap of imagination of imagining that there was a universal Turing machine, a universal program that could take as input any other program, any other input to the program, and simulate the behavior of that program on that input. Computer scientists today call this an interpreter. This is an absolutely mind-boggling idea. You have a program, if you wish, a computer, that can simulate any other program. That would behave differently, not depending on the actual piece of software you ask it to emulate. Now, for us today, this is a commonplace idea, but this is truly a revolutionary thing. There is no other machine which is built by mankind that can serve all these purposes just simply by changing the program into it. If you have your car by changing the program into it, it does not become a toaster. It stays a car. Everything else we build is actually built for a single purpose, essentially. If we can do more than one thing, it's just a variation, and it's because there is software in it. Because there is a universal computing device in it. Mind-boggling idea, and Turing had this idea. And the next step was, of course, because he was not only interested in the logic of things, but he was also interested in building things, the next step was actually building physical realization of this universal computing device. And this was happening at roughly the same time in the US, where von Neumann, uh, of the von Neumann architecture, great mathematician, a uh, very vain man, incredibly bright, according to everyone who says this. Uh, a famous uh, Hungarian mathematician said, most mathematicians prove what they can, von Neumann proves what he wants. Uh, <laughs> just to give you an idea of the kind of status that the guy had. He built the ENIAC and Edvard computers uh, while, uh, uh, while working on the Los Alamos project. They played an, in, an, an important role in the development of the hydrogen bomb. In the UK, Turing was working on the ACE, the automatic computing engine. Now, make no mistakes, you don't read it many places, but von Neumann's ENIAC EDVAC report was rather incomplete. Uh, it just went ahead and did it, and fortunately did it, because, well, I mean, sort of otherwise, maybe things would not have gone the way they went. Uh, whereas Turing's ACE report was much more detailed. There was everything in there, everything. All the computer was described down to the logical circuitry, and in fact, Turing even estimating how much it would cost to build it. At the time, 11,200 quid. Uh, moreover, and this is another testimony to the uh, vision of the man, he also listed 10 problems that the A's could actually solve. Amongst them, chess playing and solving jigsaw puzzles. Now, you might think this is commonplace today, but until that point, nearly everyone saw computers as being entities for number crunching. Playing chess is not a number crunching problem. Solving jigsaw puzzles is not a number crunching problem. Everyone else was thinking of machines to aid in numerical calculations. Turing went far beyond this. He was thinking of machines that could do abstract symbolic computation. So, as part of this, operations like addition, multiplication, were actually programmed in software in the A's. There was no hardware, explicit hardware support for this. When people prompted, sort of pointed out that maybe he should do so, he said, no thanks. I don't want to change my design so that it would go in a von Neumann direction. Why? And that's his quote, you can read it, it's uh, sort of, uh, 
There is a nice British touch there, is there? I don't want to go in that direction. That's the American tradition of solving one's difficulties by means of throwing equipment at it rather than by thought. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sorry, I don't want sort of to uh, say anything more to this effect. These are Turing's words, and I just love them when I read them. <laughs> now, let's go back to, uh, uh, to what Turing did in this groundbreaking paper in 1936. There are actually all books, for instance this one, which I also truly recommend. This book is nothing but an annotated version of Alan Turing's 1936 paper. Uh, it's called The Annotated Turing, a guided tour through Alan Turing's historic paper on computability and the Turing machines. The paper is about 30 pages long, this is about 300 pages long. Uh, but it's wonderful, I mean there's lots of historical uh, information. Now, as I told you, in this paper, Turing was interested in understanding what real numbers can be mechanically computed. Now, when we study mathematics, we just think of the real numbers as things that are out there. But in reality, the vast majority of them maybe is not out there. Uh, the vast majority of them cannot be computed. There are only a countable number of them that can be computed, and Turing characterized, in some sense, those that can be computed, which are those that the Turing machine can spit out given sufficient, uh, a sufficient amount of time. These are the computable real numbers. Now, since Turing was interested in uh, machines that could spit out infinite decimal expansions, for him, it was important to determine whether once you give it a description of a Turing machine, it would actually run forever. If it doesn't run forever, it doesn't spit out an infinite decimal expansion. This is what he called the satisfactoriness problem, but today we know it as the halting problem. This is the mother of all unsolvable problems, as Saddam Hussein would have said in his heyday. Uh, so what does the halting problem ask? Well, I will tell you also maybe on the next slide if I have time. Uh, but anyway, the whole thing problem asks, is there a mechanical process that, given as input, a machine and an input to that machine determines in a finite number of steps whether the machine that it receives as input terminates its computation or when it's fed with the data that it's given. Now, Turing machines are a general model of computation. What does this mean? Well, this means that anything you can remotely imagine to do computationally on any device, you can do on a Turing machine. Turing machines can do all and only the things which are computationally feasible, that the mechanical process can do. And this has gone under the name as the Church-Turing uh, thesis. It is a thesis because it cannot be proven. You know, it can only be disproven. We, it's a thesis because it equates the informal notion of compute, mechanically computable process with the formal notion of a Turing machine. One of them is an idea, the other one is actually a formalization of that idea. This thesis will be disproved if someday someone comes up with a mechanical process, something that humankind, any human being, would determine as a good, honest-to-God mechanical process that cannot be coded as a Turing machine. So far, nobody has seen uh, these things. Now, I cannot resist a technical aside. I apologize for that, but I really have to tell you, I burn, I have to tell you about the whole team problem. Now, I already described to you the whole team problem. Huh? So there will be three technical slides, and then we go back to the non-technical stuff. But I really have to try and explain to you why the whole thing problem is undecidable. It's a fantastic thing. Once you've seen it, you won't believe it. Okay, so let's fix a programming language, any programming language of your choice. And the whole thing problem for this programming language is the following one. It's the problem of determining whether there is a mechanical process, let's call it Q or HALT, a program in that programming language that takes two inputs, a program in that language and an input to the program and determines whether P run on X will terminate or not in a finite number of steps. 
It's the problem of determining whether an arbitrary computation on an arbitrary datum that you can get as input will ever terminate eventually or not. Turing showed that no such program Q can ever exist. It's a logical impossibility. It's logically impossible that if you have any programming language under the sky, that in that programming language you can program a termination checker, which would be nice to have. So why is this the case? Well, Turing used one of the great gambits in the mathematical uh, armament. He did the proof by contradiction. Let's assume that such a program Q exists. From this assumption, we derive an utter contradiction. So how did this proceed? I hope you can see this picture, which I stole from a book by David Arell, who's uh, a great expositor of these things. Okay, so let's assume that we have a program, Q, that does solve the whole thing problem. Now, if we have such a program, we can use it as a subroutine in another program. And what does this program do? What does this program do? It takes as input a program W, it copies the source code for W, and then it feeds Q with the program W both as a program and as an input. Remember, there is no difference between programs and inputs. Uh, you can encode any program as a natural number, so any program can runs, that runs on integers can, in principle, run on its own code. Okay, there is a little bit of self-referentiality here. You run Q with input WW. If Q says W terminates on input W, then you make the program loop by adding a while through to skip afterwards. If Q says W will not terminate on input W, then you stop. Note, Q is a program that is able to determine whether W will terminate on input W. Huh? We are given that this program exists. It's able to determine in a finite number of steps whether that is possible. You agree with me that if Q is a program, this is a program. It's a computational process. It just says, copy your input, run Q on your input twice, so on your input WW. If Q tells me yes, you loop forever. If Q says no, you stop. Easy peasy. Now, what happens if we actually run this program on itself? We can do that. This is a program, we can run it on itself. Well, let's follow the logical implications. S runs on itself, what does it mean? That S makes two copies of S, and then asks the termination checker, do I alt, do I hold on input myself? If the answer is yes, then S will, not, will loop forever. If the answer is no, then S will terminate on input S. But both of them are contradictions. Uh, because if Q says S will hold on input S, then S will loop forever on input S. If Q says actually S will not terminate its computation on input S, then S will actually terminate on input S. Bullshit. What was the problem? The problem is that we actually assumed that such a problem Q existed. Because just from that assumption, we have been able to derive a contradiction. Now, the meta message. The power and the glory, and also the problems, the existence of unsolvable problems in computation, come from self-referentiality. S runs on itself. We can write machines, programs, that can run on themselves as input. We use recursion all the time. The people who've been taking my algorithms course have been hearing me say that all the time. Now, self-referential statements, they are just with us. They've been with us from the very, very beginning. And people have been thinking about them all the time. Now, in computer science, they find their natural embodiment. That's the power and the curse of computation. And if you're at home and you want to mind boggle yourself a little bit, think about whether this sentence is true or false. 
This sentence is false, so if it's true, it's false. And if it's false, it's true. Fantastic. That's nothing but Turing's argument in one line. Okay, but what else Turing did Turing do? Uh, well, I already told you about Bletchley Park. Uh, Emir will give a talk on the 17th of February where he will tell us about Turing's code-breaking work. Absolutely mind-bogglingly good. Uh, he put logic to the service of decrypting uh, the Enigma code of the Nazi, uh, the Nazi uh, Navy. Uh, and this all happened in a, in a placid mansion, Bletchy Park, where this year lots of celebrations will take place. He didn't just do that. As I've already told you, he's the father of artificial intelligence. Since 1930, when he was a Sherburne, uh, when he was a Sherburne, he, he started experiencing his homosexuality and his first boyfriend, if you wish, his first love, uh, Christopher Morecambe died, and when he died, young, uh, uh, Alan Turing started thinking about sort of uh, what is it that it takes for sort of what is the spirit, what is the mind? Is there a scientific theory of the mind? So naturally, since he believed that our brains are nothing but large digital devices, as soon as he had the computer, he started thinking as to what it would take for this computer to exhibit intelligence. He devised the Turing test. You know, this picture, if you can read it, that's a picture of Hall. For those of you who have seen Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, Hall is the computer that is on board the spacecraft. And in the movie, they say it's the first and only computer that passed the Turing test. Uh, well, what is the Turing test? The Turing test is a test that, uh, uh, that Ingvi Björnson and, uh, and uh, uh, Christine Thorison will tell us about in their presentation. It's a test that Turing proposed to determine when a machine could be said as a, as to exhibit human-like intelligence. But he didn't stop there. He started in 1952, he wrote a paper on mathematical biology in the, the field of morphogenesis. Now, what is morphogenesis? Morphogenesis is the study of the chemical processes that make sure that certain biological entities like us start taking a certain shape at a certain point. Why do our hearts develop as hearts and they take this shape simply by chemical processes? Turing developed a theory, he put forward a Turing hypothesis for pattern formation, which has been absolutely seminal in mathematical biology. And when he died, people found several more papers that he wrote and then ended up in his collective works, they were unpublished. Also, this will be soon on a screen next to you on the 8th of March, Bjartney Alderson will tell us about Turing's contribution to uh, uh, morphogenesis and mathematical biology. In fact, surprisingly perhaps, this paper, the one paper on mathematical biology, is his most cited work today, even more than the work that led to the development of the computer. Incredible. Now, you can ask yourself, what did this bring to Turing? Well, you know, my late father used to say that if you get a medal, you've been hit many times. Uh, so life has not been kind to you. Uh, in a sense, today, uh, Turing is getting a lot of kudos, but while during his lifetime, he didn't get any kudos whatsoever. Uh, actually, he was beaten up quite a bit. Now, since his Sherburne days uh, in his boarding school, Turing was a declared homosexual. In 1952, in January, he was charged with gross indecency. There is a, the whole story of why this happened. I'm not going to tell it to you right now. Uh, the nasty thing was that he was offered a choice between being imprisoned and chemical castration. He chose chemical trans castration uh, via estrogen hormone injections. Uh, this made him a changed man. Uh, changed so much that in, uh, on the 7th of June 1954, he committed suicide by eating an apple with cyanide in it. Now, that's no coincidence. Snow White was one of his favorite fairy tales. So he played his Snow White role there. He ate an apple 
which was poisoned with cyanide. Now, there are all kinds of things, I mean, sort of, uh, all kinds of controversies about this death, but apparently the police took over the scene just about immediately. The reason why a lot about his death and about his later life uh, was a secret was because he knew so many secrets from the world because of all his code-breaking war that people were actually worried in the government that because of his homosexuality he could become a Russian spy or whatever. In a letter uh, to a friend of his, Norman Routledge, uh, which he signed, uh, Yours, uh, Alan, in Distress, uh, he came up with a syllogism, which I think sort of sums up his uh, spirit, even at a very tasting time. He said, Turing believes machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. And I think if you play around with the word lies here, uh, you will understand that there was a double meaning. Uh, there. Now, as I've told you, you get medals eventually if you've been beaten up long enough and if your contribution is like Turing's contribution. In computer science, we, our version of the Nobel Prize is the Turing Award that has been given for 19, from 1966 to today, every year by the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, for outstanding contributions to computer science. There is a lot of literature that has been published and is being published. There will be a lot coming out this year, you can bet on it, uh, about Turing's contribution. And this is the cover of a book that will come out on the day of his death, but in 2012, which is edited by Barry Cooper and uh, Jan van Leuven. And Barry Cooper is the guy who's really the prime motor behind all the Alan Turing celebrations. And this is going to be a collection of some of his seminal contributions together with an appraisal of his work by modern luminaries. So we'll make sure that there is a copy of this in the library at Reykjavik University when it comes out. Now that's the end of my story. What I want to, what I hope that you will get from this story is that you will come out of this room really with this quote in, in your mind. It's difficult to say that Turing was the father of computer science. Uh, that was the title of my talk. It was a bit controversial. Whenever you have any idea or anything under the sky, there is not a single father for it. Uh, lots of people contributed to the development of the computer. Lots of, of people contributed to the development of the idea of understanding what computation is. But the fact remains that everyone who uses taps a keyboard, opens a spreadsheet, or a word processing program, or anything else you do on a machine of this type, is operating on an incarnation of the Turing machine. So everything you do today, when you go home and read your email, think about Turing, and the fact that without his contribution, you will not be doing this stuff most likely today, or you would be doing it differently. Thank you. Okay, the slide says any questions, so if you have any questions, especially those that I'm able to answer, uh, feel free to ask, but you don't have to. I think you all want to go home. Yes, Simir. Uh, you don't think you're going to contribute to biology? I never actually read up on this, but I know you So uh, the question is uh, uh, about Alan Turing's uh, contributions to biology. Uh, Yes, sort of Alan Turing's contribution to biology, published contribution is one paper, and it's this paper on, uh, mathem on the mathematical theory of morphogenesis. So uh, he basically proposed a theory uh, that is based on Fibonacci ideas uh, that explains apparently pretty well why certain chemical processes lead to the development of certain shapes in certain types of biologic biological entities. So on March 8th, uh, Bjartney will give us a talk about this. Uh, it's, there, there, he actually did more work in uh, the last two years of his life on uh, mathematical biology, but this is unpublished. It's only available in his collective works. And actually, I, honestly, I don't know what it deals with. Uh, this work is also described in the uh, biography of Turing, Alan Turing, the Enigma, by Andrew Hodges. And I still have a faint hope 
that we will be able to bring him over to Iceland to talk about the man, Alan Turing, and his work. Uh, so if any of you has any money uh, to share with us for this purpose, please feel free to make a donation when you come out. Yes, there is a question uh, from Pradipta. Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, uh, Pradipta said that sort of uh, his impression was that the ENIAC was basically built and then uh, sort of uh, John von Neumann jumped on the bandwagon and formalized uh, the design and whether there was any connection uh, between von Neumann and, uh, uh, and Alan Turing. Uh, regarding the first point, you're absolutely right. Other people have built the ENIAC. Uh, in fact, these people were absolutely miffed when uh, uh, John von Neumann actually wrote the ENIAC Edward report as a single author. Uh, so they were not very pleased uh, when that happened. But I mean, John von Neumann, as I said, was supposedly a vain man, and he probably thought that he had done the whole work. I don't know, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there was some connection between von Neumann and Alan Turing. So Alan Turing worked on his PhD thesis with Church in Princeton, so the two met. In fact, uh, von Neumann wrote a letter of recommendations uh, for the PhD program at Princeton for Alan Turing, in case he needed one, uh, after having written uh, that paper before. Uh, and they also exchanged the reports. So uh, Turing knew about the ENIAC report and the Edvard report. They, he knew about the work. He had visited Princeton when uh, the computers were being built. And the Americans, John von Neumann knew about uh, the work that Alan Turing had done about the, uh, uh, on the ACE computer. As you can say, as, as I hope I have hinted that there were some sort of philosophical difference, some difference in methodology between the two camps, but they were striving for the same things. Okay, I think I let you go home. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs>